if people actually knew this shame that I have, no one would ever love me, no one would ever accept me, no one would ever want to hang out with me, be my friend, they would outcast me. That was the internal mm. conversation. How do you come back from adversity when you reach mm. the dream and then the dream bursts? How do you come back? How do you get over that? And how do you come back and be successful again? Yeah, well, I can share how I did it. Mm. I, uh, for me, it was about a year and a half of breakdown and confusion and maybe a little depression, sleeping on my sister's couch, unsure and unclear what I wanted to do. So what I did is what I knew best, which is sports. What do I need to be a great athlete, I need to have a great coach. So at that time, I started looking for mentors and coaches to guide me in life, in business, and just being a, a better man, all these things. I was 23, 24 at the time. And so first step for me was finding mentors with a model that I could mimic. Finding a mentor that had some type of life or business or career that I could model and mimic myself. And I found three of those men early on. Um, to kind of coach me and guide me and give me feedback. That was step one. The second thing was just figuring out, okay, I need to shed this identity that I was living in. I was holding on to being this athlete and living this dream. The dream has died. I can't keep holding on to something that's mm. dead. I need to grieve it. I need to experience the loss, the death, and let it go and move on into something else and recreate a new vision for my life. That was really hard for me, creating a new vision. Yeah. Uh, just because it was something that was the only thing I focused on. The only thing I thought about was playing sports. And to have that end at 23, at least at 35, you go ahead at 12 years. <laughs> exactly. How many years did you have of success? I only had a year. Yeah, I mean, a that year playing professionally. Year. I mean, wow. I played years, four years in sure. college, and then I played professionally for one year, but I got injured as a rookie. Yeah. So it was, you know, when the dream gets cut short, it's challenging. It's sad. There's a loss. There's an yeah. identity loss. There's a dream loss, all these things. For me, I took it really challenging and really hard. Uh, but recreating a new vision, having some guides and mentors mm. to support, to have a model to see, okay, that's something that I could be inspired by, what they've created 20 years away from now. It's something that I could be interested in. They have this skill, they've built that business, they have this family life. Okay, there's something I can hold on to and think about. Uh, and creating a vision, what do I want for this next year? So I started just getting clear on, okay, some goals, some simple goals. Mm -hmm. I want to get off my sister's couch. Yeah. What do I need to do? I need to make $3,000 a month. How do I do that? And breaking that part down. Um, that was the first couple steps for me. And then I really started to think of what are, as an early on in my teens, I, I started creating a fear list. A fear list. A fear list. Okay. And in order for me to become more fearless, I... I need to write down my biggest fears, my biggest insecurities, my biggest shames, and then create an experience or some type of uh, challenge to go all in on my biggest fears until the fear disappears. Because I can't be fully in my power and confident if I have all this shame and insecurity. And so every year I think about it, what is my biggest fear, my biggest shame, my biggest insecurity, my biggest embarrassment that I've yet to overcome I make a list and then I go tackle those things. And those give me more confidence, more skills, more tools to be a better human. So what is your biggest fear right now, today? Uh, right now, well, the thing that was my biggest insecurity, I should mm -hmm. say, I feel like I've conquered a lot of fears uh, in the last eight to 10 years specifically, but the biggest insecurity this year was, was more of like something I've been letting myself I haven't been proud of, of myself for the last 20 years. 20 years ago, I started taking Spanish class in high school and really enjoyed it, but I was horrible at it. And I didn't pick it up quickly, something I struggled with. And as an athlete, I'm used to picking things up quickly, hmm. naturally getting it, being good at things quickly. Um, but that's never happened with Spanish. But every year for the last 20 years, I've said to myself, this is the year I'm going to learn it and I find some app or book or whatever, it gets too challenging and then I stop and I give up. For 20 years I've given up, but there's still something inside me that wants to learn Spanish. But I'm insecure and afraid because I know that I'm not good at it. I know that I'm gonna look silly, I'm gonna sound stupid, I'm gonna stutter over my words when I try it and practice it. And so I said, okay, for 20 years I've regretted this. At the end of every year I regret that I didn't do Spanish. And then I say I'm going to do it the next year and I don't do it. So I keep 
like I'm out of integrity with myself. I either need to kill this dream and let it go mm -hmm. and not think about it, or I need to go all in on it until I'm not afraid of it anymore. So I finally said, I'm finding someone, I'm paying them in advance, someone who can teach me and mentor me, who can teach me Spanish. And about six months ago, I started it, and it's been miserable. It's been miserable. It's been extremely challenging and hard. But I tell you what, something happened a couple of weeks ago because I keep showing up every morning, three times a week for an hour, and I feel like I'm not going anywhere. A couple of weeks ago, I started to get it a little bit, and I was like, oh, I'm actually able to put some things together. And I'm like, okay, if this takes five years, it's gonna take five years. It may not happen overnight. It's not going to. But I'm proud of the effort and the work I'm putting in, and I don't care if I look silly in front of my teacher and these things, like I'm learning, I'm growing, and I'm proud of the effort. So for me, that's been a fear. It's like a different level of fear now. Yeah, and it's so weird that you think of looking silly because most people find when you can't say their language, they find it enchanting. It's like when people yeah. try to, when French people speak English and when English people speak French and we get it wrong, most people find that really enchanting. They love the fact that you made an effort, even if the effort doesn't quite work. Right. So that's interesting that you would fear looking silly. I think it was always a fear growing up of like being embarrassed in front of my classmates because I would speak. Uh, our teachers would ask us to read aloud and I couldn't read. I couldn't read in middle school, high school. I was struggled a lot with reading and writing. So I think I was just insecure yeah. when it came to like books and learning and things like that, challenging subjects. So it kind of reminds me of being back in high school when I got made fun of a lot. Yeah. And so it's okay. I haven't dealt with this yet. I haven't overcome this yet. Let me go all in on it. And no one identified that. I remember years ago, I was working with a very famous footballer and he said to me, you know, you've changed my life and it's thanks to you. I said, oh, could you write that for me? Uh, write me a little testimonial. And he said, you write it. I said, no, you write it. He said, no, <laughs> you write it and I'll sign it. I said, I'd oh. rather you wrote it. And he said, I can't okay. write. Wow. I was really shocked. He said, well, you know, I was going to be a famous footballer. I left school at 14. My family knew at seven I'd be an athlete, so I never bothered at school. And he said, and um, I can't write. And I was so shocked that A, he couldn't write, but B, that the school... Didn't, I mean, that's not his fault, but how could a school not pick that up in a child and would just let them coast through and not realize he couldn't write and, of course, he couldn't really read? But did your school do? They just didn't notice. They weren't tuned no, into that. Or were you good I, at hiding it? I was very good at lying and cheating mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and copying people's homework. I was very good at this, which I'm not proud of, but I had to survive. Yeah, but that's smart. When I went into eighth grade, they started testing us uh, and... I had a second grade reading level when I went to eighth grade. So I just remember being in eighth grade saying, oh, I'm stupid. Mm. I'm dumb. I can't read. I would say these things to myself. Yeah. And I'm never going to be good enough in school. Like all these things. So obviously, you know, using that language and thinking and believing it didn't support me. But luckily, the school I went to put me into uh, tutoring right away. Like they were either like, we're going to have to hold you back a few grades or you need to go in these classes, like these extra tutoring mm. classes. So during lunch breaks, I was with a tutor when everyone was at like lunch and recess. Uh, I had to go in early after school. I remember my senior year in high school, my English teacher, I was failing senior year English. And she was like, Lewis, you can't go play football in college if you don't pass senior year English. Mm -hmm. Like you, they won't let you get it. You know, you can't apply to school if you don't pass this. And she would work with me every day after class until I got a passing grade. I wasn't great but I got a passing grade and so I had that support throughout all of high school and college just to finish and graduate and it's so amazing how your childhood stays with you You can be the most successful Absolutely. famous drop-dead gorgeous person in the world but that residue of what you lived as a child yeah. is often in the room with you people are always shocked about that how many people who are famous are insecure uh -huh. nervous self-conscious waiting to find out that oh, you're not that successful person at all. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, for me, over the last, I guess, 10, 12 years, I've been able to overcome a lot of fears in business or marketing and mo around money and relationships. So every year there's new fears or mm. insecurities that may come up that I get to conquer. And I just try to figure out what is the thing that's holding me back the most this year. Yeah. And every time I'm at a new level of life, there's going to be a different type of fear and insecurity that comes up. So I just keep trying to tackle those things so that they don't have power over me. 
But if you looked at all the fears, would you say they all have the same theme? That they're all a fear of being rejected or it's, looking stupid yeah, or looking it's, silly. It's the fear of like being judged or mm. people making fun of me yeah. or, and stuff like that from childhood stuff. Yeah. Which I'm fully aware of and I am am ha- am able to laugh at myself and have people laugh at me and I'm mm-hmm. much better at it now. But I think it's certain things related to like school. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, learning from a textbook, learning a language was a school subject. And so it's figuring out how do I make it more fun and enjoyable where it's not, I can mess up all day long and it's not a big deal. So it's reframing it um, and not beating myself up for for not figuring it out right away. It's not going to be something I'm going to learn in two weeks. It's a language. It's going to take time. And I'm not, inv- I'm not immersing myself six months in another country. I'm doing three lessons a week. Mm. So it's, it's understanding that this is the small wins on a daily basis. It's going to take years. It's going to take a lifetime to continue to maintain. But it, for me, I'm really proud of going all in on that fear and being consistent and having a coach and a mentor teach yeah. me and paying in advance so that I know I have to show up and have yeah. accountability and doing it and just being like, oh, look how far I've come in six months. Like, imagine what I'll do in another six months. So those little wins say, you know what? I'm proud of myself, I can do this. Yeah. And I think every year, it's for me, it's important to create a fear list and then go all in on the first couple so that you can become more fearless. And you're doing salsa as well, aren't you? Learning I've been doing salsa, salsa for too. a long time. That oh, was a you? huge fear. That Tell was me a, about that. That was probably one of the biggest insecurities because I started that in 2005, mm-hmm. 16 years ago, I guess. And I remember I went to this jazz club that my brother was playing at. He was a jazz violinist. And uh, they had salsa dancing at this jazz club one night. So I went back to check it out because I wanted to see what is this salsa dancing thing. And I've only seen it on TV and movies. And I went there and I was blown away by, it was pretty much all um, Latin people who were salsa dancing. And I was this tall, white American guy standing over the crowd. And I was so intimidated, I was in awe and intimidated at the same time by how smooth these guys were, how beautiful these women looked, and the artistry of salsa dancing. And I went back once a week for three months and I did not dance at all because I was so afraid. And of, I started. But what were you afraid of? I was afraid of, of looking bad. I was afraid Look, of that same thing again. I was afraid of looking bad. I was afraid mm. of like messing up in front of people. I was Go afraid on. that I'd be laughed at by yeah. everyone else because I'm not. I don't know this culture. I'm trying to like learn this stuff where everyone's a pro. It looked like, and I also didn't want to make the girls look bad. I was mm. like, you dance with me, you're going to look horrible because mm. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I didn't want to make them look bad. I didn't want to look bad, and I was afraid of getting laughed at and judged. That's been always my biggest fear, yeah, judge, the judgment of other people. That. And it's less and less now. But And I remember one girl eventually was like, that I got to know a little bit, she was finally dragged me out on the dance floor after three months of going there every week, pulls me out. I'm in the middle. It's like in the middle of a scene of a movie or something. I'm in the middle. It takes me in the middle of the dance floor. All these people dancing around me. The music is going. And she's like, just follow my basic step. And we did the basic step for the next 20 minutes. I just stared down at my feet for 20 minutes and it was like sweating, sweating. I was like, man, I'm so horrible, I'm bad. I'm like stepping on her feet. I, she's like smiling and having fun and I'm just so tight, like afraid. And then she she stops me and she goes, Lewis, look up. And I look up, she goes, look around you. And I look around me and the most amazing thing, no one was looking at yeah, me. No, no one cared, everyone was dancing yeah. and having fun. And if anything, they might have been like, oh, okay, like, oh, he, he's a beginner. He doesn't look that good, but let me go back to dancing and having fun. They yeah. they weren't talking about me. No one cared. If anything, they're probably like, good for him. Yeah, you know, cool. Good for I mean, trying. I used to teach yoga, and I would say to people, don't look in the mirror. Most <laughs> you shouldn't have a mirror in yoga. And no one's looking. They're all too busy trying to do their own tree, trying to stand <laughs> up, trying to put their right. leg behind their ear. I mean, they're not looking at you. Yeah. That's not what it's about. But then people say, I can't go to the gym because I'm not fit enough I to work know. out. I can't go to a class because I won't be able to get it right. I couldn't go to Zumba. But no one's looking at no you. They're cares. far too busy. They don't care. It's like I love that story. The people who care don't matter, and the people who matter don't care. That's it. Because people just salute you for trying, for turning up, for having a go, and dancing is about fun. But twice in the first 10 minutes, you've mentioned that same fear, the fear yeah. 
of getting it wrong, of looking silly, of being mm-hmm. laughed at. But I also know you've taken up boxing. So I did. That was another thing that. that I took up this year as well because I was like, I need a new challenge. I'm, you know, I've done lifting, I've done all these different things, but I was like, I feel like I need a new challenge where I have a beginner's mind. Mm-hmm. Because when I started salsa dancing, when I started uh, Spanish about six months ago, like anytime I start something new that I'm afraid of or that I'm not good at, I just know that I gained so much confidence in mm-hmm. that journey of applying that skill, of learning that skill. So I've done, yeah, almost 10 sessions and it's, it's amazing because when, what I did is I said, I need the best trainer I can find. So I found an amazing British guy who lives here, who is an Olympian for London or for, for the UK and um, a professional fighter. He's an amazing trainer. And I said, I need to find the best mentor because it'll accelerate my learning curve and yeah. I'll gain more confidence quickly. And the first few sessions, I was horrible. I mean, I looked so bad, terrible, tight, like all these things, my footwork was off. It felt like I was salsa dancing again for the first time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like I went again today and I feel like, man, I'm just getting better every time. Yeah. Because I'm coachable. I'm taking feedback. I've invested in it. I keep showing up and I'm just enjoying the little wins. Yeah. And again, he's not, no one's looking you to see what you're doing no. wrong. They're looking to see what you're doing right. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's a question for you because you have this fear of looking silly, but you've written two books. Mm hmm. Tell me how you did that, because most people who write, when they write, think, oh, gosh, I hope it doesn't get rejected. What if nobody likes it? And people yeah. think writers just sit down and write, and a lot of writers really struggle with how the audience is going to perceive what they're writing, even as they're writing it. And a lot of writers, amazingly, dump 80% of what they've written, keep going back and doing it again. Really? Yeah. Uh, How did I do it? So tell me how you wrote your first book. I think I've always been more inspired and led by creating and my goals than my fears. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm afraid, I feel like eventually I'll do what it takes to overcome it by putting something out Mm. there. And I think the book would have been a dream of mine for many, many years, probably six or seven or maybe eight years where I was like, one day I want to write a New York Times bestseller and I want to prove to myself that a dumb kid who couldn't read and write that well can go do something like this. And that drove me. I was like, I want to prove this to myself, but I want to create something that serves other people. And I think I was a little, even then, that was back probably like, what was that, six years ago now, the first book. I was definitely reactive to negative reviews. Yeah, I was trying to ask you that. The first book, I was more, I was like, gosh, this person has no clue how much effort I went into this, what I created here, who are they? So I definitely had a defensive mind. And I learned quickly after that book to stop trying to defend myself Mm. with my work. Yeah. I had another coach who saw me, this was probably five years ago, maybe six years ago, around that time, I was very defensive on Twitter or Instagram comments or whatever. Anytime someone critiqued me, it was like I had to convince them that they were wrong. And he saw this one day and he called me and he was like, Lewis, why are you engaging in these negative comments? Mm. Why are you trying to defend yourself? Just you're wasting your time and energy trying to defend yourself. Just thank them for the feedback and move on or don't reply. Yeah. Either one. But defending a negative comment is not going to do you any good. It's only going to hurt you more. Yeah. Focus on the people that are inspired. Take the feedback and see if there's anything true there and apply it if it makes sense. But otherwise, don't engage. So I've learned over many years of like pain and, you know, holding on to this like defensiveness that it doesn't work for me anymore. So it took yeah. a while. Yeah. When my first book came out, it got so many amazing people wrote to me and said, you're paying for these reviews. It's not possible. How could you have all your, this is all paid for. You bought all these reviews. So when I got a bad one, I was like, oh, I'm so glad I've got a horrible one going, I hate that book and I hate the writer because now it's more balanced. Looks, so I, I was yeah, actually really, I thought, yeah, I, I need to pay one to give me a bad review <laughs> so that everyone would think I'd pay someone to give me all these good reviews. Right. But then you wrote a second book. Yeah. Knowing, of course, people think, people have this weird belief that if you become rich or famous or successful, your life's a dream mm-hmm. and that there is no more rejection, there is no more difficulty, there is no more issues struggle yeah and of course it's not true and to write a book or put yourself anywhere in the public eye like i I work with a lot of actors and i say look you have to be able to deal with rejection sometimes you get rejected i mean when my little girl was a baby she she was a model she was so amazing she had masses of hair and they said oh no 
She's too pretty. When you model baby clothes, the baby can't be cuter than the clothes. Oh so she got rejected for being, for being too, too pretty. pretty. Yeah, they, she did a lot of stuff, but she couldn't model baby clothes. They said, she's so gorgeous. They'll just look at the cl her and not the clothes. And then a few of my classes, that you know, I went for a role and they went, oh, no. Mm. When I called them up, they said, no, you were too beautiful. It was, you're not, you, you would outshine the leading lady. Wow. One of my clients got rejected from being a dancer with Kylie Minogue. And they, didn't, they said, you're too tall. Kylie's dancers can't be too tall. Madonna always dances with guy backing dancers because she's not tall. Mm. But often we think, you don't like me. And someone says, well, I don't like you because you're too tall, too beautiful, too smart. But people don't see that. So obviously, when you read all the reviews and try to reason with somebody who's unreasonable and just doesn't yeah. like you for no other reason right. than they don't like you. What happened with the second book? Were you over that by then, or did you still go back and look at the reviews? No, I was more over that by then. I think, um, you know, it's interesting. I remember, I think I had another issue. For like a day, I was upset because the book didn't hit the New York Times list. And I was thinking, these people have no clue how much harder I worked on the second yeah. book and how much more meaningful it was and all these things. So I think for a day, I was like, oh man, you know, I was kind of just bummed out that I didn't get the result. The expectation didn't mm. happen of what I was thinking. And then it took about a day or two until I was like, you know what? I need to get back to focusing on the mission, not about like me accomplishing yeah. the goal, but focusing on service. And that mentality shifted me back to not an expectation hangover, but okay, we're just going to keep helping people and see what happens from it. And you were really real about your childhood in that book. Absolutely, I mean, you, yeah. you took the lid off everything, yeah. didn't you? yeah. What was that like, really exposing even the abuse this and was the, the things that happened this to you? This was the scariest thing I can th uh, think was that I've ever done, mm. was talk about being sexually abused. And I talked about it originally eight years ago in a, a small group, an emotional intelligence workshop that I was in after like the second week. And I, it felt like death. It felt like I was about to die. Wow. Sharing, this is all I could imagine. It of felt course. like... If people actually knew this shame that I have, no one would ever love me, no one would ever accept me, no one would ever want to hang out with me, be my friend, they would outcast me. That was the internal mm. conversation. If they knew this shame and insecurity of mine. And so I think that's why I held on to it for 25 years until I found this, this, this workshop that I went to that created many, many moments for me to finally get to open up and kind of peel back the layer of my... Mm my emotions and my shame and i did it once there and it felt after after i shared it in this experience so many of the men from the room who were in there came up to me afterwards and were like saying the most incredible things like you're yeah. my hero you know this happened to me when i was a kid or whatever and i never had the courage to talk about it thank you for talking about it you're giving me the courage and many men shared that with me, which which I felt like, okay, I feel safer sharing it to an, uh, an yeah. environment of people that had something, something mm. similar in common. But no one else can know about this. Mm. I still was insecure and worried about what people would think about me outside of this context. Like, what about my friends and family? Would they accept sure. me? What about my audience? All these things. After about six months, I realized I started sharing with it one by one to friends, family members, and I felt more and more free the more I talked about it. The more I felt like, oh, people accepted me. Or I'm accepting myself, whether they accept me or not. And I felt like the final thing I needed to do was talk about it publicly. And I don't recommend people share their shame publicly, but since I had a platform and I was talking mm. about these types of things with other people, I felt it necessary to open up on my podcast about it about seven years ago, I guess it was. And it's still the most downloaded thing and most you know viewed page yeah. on my website this me opening up about it sure and it was again i felt like another death i feel like i'm gonna die but it was this... really another life exactly it brought you to life because the basis of all friendship is we choose people who share our vulnerabilities people really? don't seem to know that I know the basis of all friendship is we pick people who share our vulnerabilities. So when I have clients who come in and go, well, I just pretend I'm perfect. You know, I tell everyone I've got a great weekend, I'm so busy, and actually I sit at home with my cat 
drinking vodka because I don't want to let anyone know that I'm lonely or sad. It's like, but then mm. that's how you make friends. We like people. Why is that? Why do like we connect us? with people that have like a similar shame or vulnerability or fear? Because they're real. You know, we like people who are real yeah. and authentic. And so people, in my experience, anyway, all of my clients who either are pretend to be perfect or appear to be perfect or without question the unhappiest but also the loneliest too really? i mean a lot of my clients will say you know when my first wife was a model and that was like having a racehorse i mean the, the the amount of work and effort and money and now my wife is normal and it's such a relief <laughs> such a relief to just be with someone warm and normal Relaxed, and yeah. funny yeah so I think just people can't relate to someone who isn't real. You know, we look at people and we think, it's like when you go to school and you're a kid and you go, hey, do you, I like Barbie, I like Barbie, I like green pasta, I like green pasta. And then they go, I like you because you're like me and I'm like you. So even as children, we look. And then as we get older, we go, do you like that football team? Is mm -hmm. that your favorite band? Is that your favorite show on Netflix? Oh, you're like me. And when people say, oh, I, I hated that show. Oh, I never eat that. I, then we can't relate. So the mm. minute you open up and share your vulnerability, because we all have vulnerabilities, now you're real and people can relate. Right. And when you're not real, people can't relate. When you believe that you don't deserve happiness, when you feel that you are not worthy of and not deserving of nice things, this is often at the root of self sabotaging destructive behavior. And when you understand why you have that belief and how you can change it forever, that allows you to expect and get great things from life. What does self-sabotage look like? Well, hey, I've always wanted a great relationship. I've met someone and now I'm really acting out. I'm not answering their calls. I'm being snippy and mean and why am I doing that when this is what I've wanted? I've got this great job and I'm turning up late. I'm not doing the work they asked me to do. I've just got to my ideal weight and now I'm deliberately binging on cakes and cookies. What's going on? So I've got a promotion and suddenly I feel demotivated. I'm always like, oh, I'm scared of this job. They're going to find out I'm not good enough. So therefore I need to sabotage it early. I'm scared this person will realize I'm not who they think I am. So let me mess it up in advance by acting out. This is so frustrating because it sets you back. It makes you fall at the first hurdle. But when you understand why you do this, that is a game changer. Understanding is power. Understanding what runs you and understanding that you have the power to change that forever. So often we don't realize this is how I don't know why my relationships don't work. I don't know why I sabotage my job. I don't know I've got this really important meeting. I've got to be in the office at eight on it and yet I'm spending all night watching Netflix. I'm almost deliberately messing this up. I'm not planning, I'm not reading, I'm not learning what I have to learn. I'm almost choosing to fail without wanting to fail at all. Self-sabotage always comes down to one thing. I don't think I'm good enough. I'm scared of failing. So let me fail fast, let me mess it up early. Then I don't have to live with that fear of it all going wrong because I made it wrong and even better. Instead of going, well, you know, I got this great job and I wasn't good enough. I didn't have the skills to go, well, I, I could have done it, but you see, I was always up all night. I was drinking, I was partying, I was wasting time and that's why it went wrong that is way less painful than saying, I didn't have the qualities, I didn't have the skill, I just wasn't up to it. Self-sabotage allows us to blame something we did rather than who we are. Our greatest fear is that we're not enough. Our greatest fear is of being rejected. When you really fear that, you will bring about sabotage so you can blame something else that stops you feeling rejected and not enough. Oh, it wasn't that. I just didn't apply myself. I messed about. I was always out. I was having a good time. 
I just didn't take it seriously. That is supposed to hurt less, but that doesn't always work. So when you are really run by this fear of failing, it's like, oh, I'm not gonna go for that job. I know I won't get it. I'm gonna go for the job I haven't even prepared. And then when I don't get it, I go, well, you know why I didn't prepare? And that hurts less than, oh, they didn't like me. They didn't think I was good. I wasn't the candidate for the job and that hurt me. But saying, well, I was, but you know, I turned up late, I got lost, I, I didn't plan the route, I didn't work out how long it took to get there, I hadn't pressed my shirt, I wasn't prepared, I didn't get the job I could have, but I messed it up. They didn't want me, they rejected me. They preferred someone else. These beliefs are painful, but sabotaging ourselves is less painful because that's what we do, that's a behavior. It's not who we are or our character traits. And there's a really deep level of not feeling you're worth it, not cooking nice food, not buying healthy ingredients, not practicing self-care, not looking after yourself, never having a massage or a treatment because, oh, I'm not worth it. Don't waste your money. When people buy you gifts and you say, you shouldn't have wasted your money on me. That's a waste of money. I don't want to spend money on that. You see, if you don't feel you're worth it, how can anyone else ever feel you're worth it? And the way to overcome this is to go, I'm worth it. I deserve this. Yes, a burger and fries is 10 bucks and the salad is 15 bucks, but it's an investment. I'm investing in my health. I'm paying for things that make me feel good. Everything you buy is because of how it makes you feel. When you say, yeah, I'm just going to take myself to bed early. I'm going to leave this event because I'm being good to myself. I'm honoring myself. I put myself to bed. I take myself to the gym. I choose healthier food. I choose healthier relationships. I choose to be in positions and conversations where I don't put myself down. When someone praises you and go, oh, me, I, I, that was just a fluke. I don't know how I did that. Oh, that was nothing. Say, thank you so much. I'm so glad you love my job, my ability. I'm pleased that you like that. My mother did that. My mother was a great cook. And every time I went for dinner, she'd go, well, it's no good today because I didn't get the right ingredient. They didn't have any rosemary. I had to use sage and we know that's no good. And, oh, I burnt it. I didn't prepare. I go, mum, stop it. You're an amazing cook. When I say this is amazing, say thank you. I'm so glad you love it. I made this for you with love. And I love the fact that you love it. So one of the ways to stop self-sabotage in its tracks is to accept praise. And when someone praises you, add to it, go, thank you so much. I love your top. Oh, this old thing, I've had it for 10 years. No, say thank you. I love it too. It's my favorite color. Praise yourself. Let in praise. The fastest way to grow your self-esteem is to let in praise. And the fastest way to diminish it is to let in criticism, especially your own. Don't do that. Stop criticizing yourself. And start to say these key phrases, I'm worth it. I'm worthy of it. I'm deserving this. I'm ready for this. I'm worthy of great love. I deserve to have someone love me and adore me and cherish me and be adored and loved and cherished by me. I deserve my talents to be recognized. My body deserves to be looked after by me. I deserve to be treated with respect. Think of all the things you deserve and start to say, I deserve this. I am worthy of this. I am ready for this. What I want wants me. What I am moving towards 
is moving towards me. Say it, state it, affirm it. Even if you don't believe it to be true, as you say it, state it and affirm it, it will become true because the mind does not know or indeed care if what you tell it is true or false, useful or useless, healthy or unhealthy, beneficial or not, it lets it in. And you have nothing to lose and everything to gain by going, I'm worth it. I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of recognition. I'm worthy of praise. I'm worthy of success. I'm deserving of love, deserving of recognition, deserving of praise, deserving of success. I am worthy and deserving of nice things and good people in my life because I'm nice and good. And there are many people in the world that were so loved and so lovable. Marilyn Monroe always comes to mind. Heath Ledger, George Michael, Philip Seymour Hoffman, even Amy Winehouse. And if we really look at these people, we can see something they have in common. They didn't feel lovable. They didn't feel worthy. They didn't feel enough. Marilyn's coach said, Marilyn, what is this deal with you dancing in front of all those GIs in skin tight clothes? No wonder. And she said, well, I have to belong to the whole world. I've never belonged to anyone or anything and I never will. When someone said to Whitney Houston, is drink the devil in life? She said, oh no, I'm the devil in my life. When Amy Winehouse wrote, I told you I was trouble. You know I'm no good. She was writing about herself. And sometimes these people write the most amazing music or books about pain. But what they're saying is I'm not worth it. I'm not deserving the self-destructed talent. I don't deserve this praise, so let me diminish it. I'm not good enough, let me get rid of it. And the only way to cure that is to look at why. Look at Britney Spears, beautiful, talented, engaging, lovable. She didn't believe that to be true. And when you try to give someone that like that love, they can't let it in because the only person who can fix that is that person. So if you can see any of you in this, even a tiny amount start to say the magic words, I'm lovable, I matter, I'm significant, I'm enough, I'm worthy of and deserving of, and add to that whatever you would love to feel worthy of or deserving of. And this is not rocket science. We all want to feel worthy of love, worthy of praise, worthy of success, worthy of happiness and joy and peace. And it's a decision. Decide that to be true. I'm worthy of attention. If you say that enough, you become worthy of attention. If you don't say it and don't fix it, you'll always be well. I'm no good with people, you see. I don't like being the center of attention. I can't have a conversation. I blush, I go bright red, I stutter. But when you say, take a breath, hey, I am worthy of attention. I'm deserving of attention. I'm great in a crowd. I can talk to anyone about anything on any level because I like myself. I'm lovable, I'm enough. I'm significant, I matter, I'm worthy. And when you say it, stated and affirm it, you're changing your reality. Write it on your fridge. Write it on your mirror, put it on your screensavers, incorporate into the passwords of your computer. So every day you must type out, write out, state those words. And don't just walk past the words on your fridge. As you walk past, state them. Speak them, affirm them in a powerful, confident voice and that will become your reality, your words shape your reality. Choose better words and what will you have? 
a better reality. We all want confidence and high self-esteem and I promise you, you were born with confidence. You might think you've lost it, but you can get it back. You can learn to radiate phenomenal self-confidence, to dream big to go after your goals knowing that you will achieve them. So click the link below and please join my 21 day confidence challenge to unlock the amazing potential that's already in you and be your very best self. Many years ago to the very, very famous film director who said, you know, I can't enjoy my success. I've done terrible, terrible things in my life. And I said, well, what? He said, no, I couldn't tell you because you'll judge me. And I said, I would never judge you. I have heard everything, everything in this office. And I don't judge anyone because no one sets out to do bad things. Sometimes they just happen. And he said, well, can I tell you later? I said, sure. He said, can, can I turn my chair to the wall? I said, yeah, of course. So he turned his chair to the wall so I wouldn't look at him and told me the story that he thought would make me hate him and despise him. He said, you know, when I was a kid, my parents were horrible parents. They were alcoholics. They didn't want me around. And at the weekend, they put me out of the house first thing in the morning, and I wasn't allowed to come back till nighttime, even if it was snowing or raining. And then he gave me any money, and I was like six years old. And I learned that I could sneak into the back of this, and remember this was 60 years ago. I could sneak in the back of a little local cinema, and I'd sit in the back row and I'd stay there all day. And after week two, this old man came and sat next to me and he gave me candy and he gave me a hot dog. And he started to stroke my leg and go, you're a lovely boy, what a lovely boy. I said, and I went back every week. And every week he bought me food and every week he molested me. And eventually he persuaded me to put my hand on him. And I did it. And that's why I'm so bad. And I said, well, I don't think you're bad. I think you're a starving child. If you were starved of food and you went into a store and stole a bread or would go, the kid is starving. You were starved of affection. And in fact, you did something I would think was very smart. You found a warm place where you were safe. Yes, you had a dirty old man touching your genitals and making you touch his, and that's not good. Could have been a million times worse. You did what you had to do. You were a starving child. And I would never judge you. And if I was, I'd think, well, kind of smart in a way that it could have been a million times worse. You could have walked the street, got run over, got taken, anything. So I wouldn't judge you because when you're a child, you're an innocent victim. That man did things to you, but you didn't do anything. You're as innocent now as you were then. You're an innocent five-year-old, six-year-old, and now you're an innocent 59-year-old. And the only person judging you is you. And when he could see that I wasn't judging him. I was actually impressed at his ability to survive in a tough, cruel, loveless world. All his fears went away. He cried a lot and then he got over it. He said, wow, when I unburdened myself, I felt so much better. And that's the great thing. When people go to AA and go, hey, you know, I sold my children's doll's house to buy alcohol. And someone says, I, I sold my kids' barbers. They went, oh, I thought I was the only one in the whole world that did that. It's not okay, but I feel so much better. I can unburden myself because the basis of friendship is that we choose people who share our vulnerability. So I want to think about if you have shame, just go back and think, what are you shameful about? Did you steal money out of your mom's purse? Because a lot of kids do. Did you steal some candy from a store? You know, I did that when I was a kid and I felt awful till I realized how many people do that. Even a famous actress, I mean, I was never allowed to have a Barbie and I stole one. And I still feel guilty about that. But you see, when you're a child, your greatest need is to connect and you connect by being the same. All my friends have got Barbies or McDonald's, all my friends get an ice cream at lunch, all my friends come to school with candy, except for me. 
and I took some money from my mum's purse and I feel so bad. But you weren't a thief, you were a child who needed to feel like everyone else because connection is a primal need, it's how we know we'll make it. So look at whatever you feel deep, deep, deep shame about and decide, you know what? I'm not gonna even feel that shame. I was teaching a class in New York a couple of years ago and one of the girls was in a terrible, terrible state and she came on stage and said, you know, my husband has hacked into all my emails. He's read all about my past. I was really promiscuous and he's going to court to get custody of our sons. He's gonna use my past against me. And I said, look, you need to not feel shameful. A judge won't judge you on your past, he'll judge you on your present. And so after we did the session, I said to my audience, by the way, who would be brave enough to put their hand up and said, they've been promiscuous or certainly had inappropriate sex. Half the room went, me. And you know, I did too. I put my hand up. And I said, look around the room. We're all the same. We've all made mistakes at 17. You have no idea who you are. We've all done silly things, taken drugs, shoplifted, had sex with a wildly inappropriate person, done something we deeply regret, said something stupid because we were 17. It's, I love that song by Bruno Mars. It says, I wouldn't have done all the things I've done if I knew one day you'd come. And she felt so much better. And then somebody wrote to me, because I had an advice column, and this is exactly what she said. I'm about to get married. My fiance asked me how many sexual partners I've had. I took off a zero, and he was so horrified, silly, he's called off the wedding. So I'm guessing that she had 200 partners and turned it down to 20, and he'd had four. And he thought that was too much, because what shall I do? How can I get the wedding back on? I said, you must call him and say, look, before I knew you, I was a wild, crazy girl. I was trying to find us. I didn't know who I was. I was looking for my dad in the arms of every man. My dad left when I was one. Every man I went to bed with, I was looking for my father. And then I got over that and I found you. And that person isn't me. And I said, but do not apologize. Don't get onto that. Oh my God, I'm so bad. You're so good. You're better than me. I'm less than you. I'm shameful. Just hold your head up high until I did crazy things. I was learning who I was. I don't do those things now. And while I regret it, I will not be ashamed because I was finding myself. Finding myself, in her case, in lots of different guys' beds. In other people, it's in drugs or drink or shoplifting or joining a gang. And after all in AA, all the AA therapists have been alcoholics because they relate. So don't blame yourself and beat yourself up for the mistakes you made when you were trying to find out who you are. By the way, if you have ever made a mistake, even a huge mistake, and you have no desire or intention of ever repeating that mistake again, you are already forgiven. If you wouldn't do it again, you've enhanced your education and who you are. You're allowed to make mistakes. Even the Bible says to err is human and to forgive is divine. And many of us cannot forgive ourselves for being human, for being flawed. Napoleon said a man who never made a mistake, never made anything. Your mistakes teach you everything. And I've learned a lot from my very own clients, some of whom went to jail. One went to jail for being a drug dealer and he's the most beautiful, loving, amazing man. One went to jail for being a tax avoider. One went to jail for being a criminal. Some of the criminals I worked with the most nicest, kindest, loyal people. And my client was taught when he was three, his father would put him into a house through the doggy door, through the cat flap, shove him in and get him to come and open the bolts and let him in or open a window. And he rewarded him for being able to open the door and help him burgle houses. And he became a hardcore criminal, but he was born into that life. When he came to me, he was so depressed and so suicidal. And I said, look, 
you need to make restitution. You know, you need to donate money to old people's homes. Go and visit people, because they were the people that they burgled most old people with cat flaps and doggy doors. And he did. And he went from being so close to ending his life to making something of his life. I said, look, you can't help what you were trained to do at three, at three. Another of my clients said that her father used to wheel her through the door on a stroller and he would tap CDs, DVDs, bottles of perfume, and she would put them in the pushchair, the stroller. And he would walk out, knowing if he got caught, he could go, well, it wasn't me, it was her. He did get caught once, he went, it's her. I don't know what, she, she keeps taking things all the time. And she felt tremendous shame, because he told her to do it and then blamed her. So look back at the mistakes you've made and how shameful you have felt. And remember, if you made these mistakes as a child, you're not even allowed to sign a contract before you're 18 because you're classified as not mature enough to know what you are doing. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself, say, I made a mistake, I was silly, I was immature, I wouldn't do it now, I'm worthy to be forgiven. Forgive yourself, let go of blame, and let go of guilt. You know, guilt doesn't make anything right. It doesn't right wrongs, it doesn't change anything. You know what it does? It makes you beat yourself up. You're allowed to make a mistake. You're allowed to do something absolutely stupid. You are not allowed to beat up your own body to invite illness and anxiety and depression because you made a mistake. And actually we like people to say, oh, guess what I did when I was a crazy sister? You'll never believe what I did. Our vulnerability makes us real and it bonds us. And after we loved Amy Winehouse with all her flaws, we like people who are flawed because we relate to them. We don't really like people who are perfect because we know they're not even real. Forgive yourself. Just say over and over these simple phrases, I made a mistake. I forgive myself. I forgive everyone who made a mistake and I forgive myself for the mistakes I made. I want the best for everyone including myself, I'm letting go of blame, letting go of shame, letting go of guilt, because it doesn't make anything better. It doesn't serve any purpose. I'm allowed to make a mistake and I'm allowed to get over it. So my most interesting, fascinating clients that I love the most have done all kinds of wild, crazy, eye-popping things. But I was always amazed at their resourcefulness. I've worked with prisoners and people who were committing crime when they were tiny, people who had inappropriate sex, people who were wildly promiscuous. I always found them fascinating, interesting, often very intelligent, incredibly resourceful. Don't blame yourself and don't feel shame. You don't have to share this with anyone at all. I just want you to say I was innocent, I was young, I was learning, and now I'm over that. You know, even dogs can be made to feel shameful for messing on the carpet, but we learn guilt. Babies have no guilt for smearing jelly on the sofa, throwing up on your new white silk shirt, soiling the, the dress or the um, shirt that you just bleached and ironed. They learn it. You learn guilt is not a natural state. You learn shame, it is not a natural state. You learn blame, shame, guilt. Learn to let it go. Forgive yourself, be forgiving. Forgive yourself, forgive everyone else. Move on, let go. It's all behind you, it is not you. What you did in the past doesn't identify you or shape you. It's just the past, the past is gone. Forgive the past, feel good about the present and feel really excited about the future. That is a recipe for happiness. Forgive the past because it's gone and you can't change it. Feel good about the present 
and feel excited about the future and your life will become amazing and stay amazing, please forgive yourself. Please be shameless and even be blameless. It's not important. It's only important to let go, move on and realize that you were innocent then and you are just as innocent now. And if you know anyone that needs to hear this very important message, please share, please like, please subscribe, share it with them, do them a favor, help other people who are living in self-hatred and torture because they made a silly, silly mistake that should never define them. Even people who've been abused, and I work with hundreds of them, I say, listen, you weren't an abuser, you were four. Just because the abuser said, oh, you made me do this, you like it, you want it, that doesn't mean that you did. You were a baby, a seven-year-old, a six-year-old. You are innocent no matter what was done to you. The person that did it, they have to live with it. You don't because you were innocent. I know that changing your thinking will change your life never more so than when you change negative thinking to positive thinking. You have too many negative thoughts and almost become a negative person. That will really impact your life. It will lessen your quality of life. If you are negative and have negative thoughts, a lot of negative thoughts, and you become a negative thinker, a negative person, that will limit your happiness, your confidence, and of course, your enjoyment of life. But no one is born negative. We learn that behavior. We learn to think negative thoughts. We learn what we live. We play the only part we've ever known, and then it becomes our own. And today, I'm going to show you with a free hypnotic audio how to stop those thoughts, how to replace them, how to change them. Because here's the truth. Everything begins with your thoughts. Your thoughts control your feelings. Your feelings control your actions. Your actions dictate your behavior and you justify all by how you think. So I know that changing your thinking will change your life never more so than when you change negative thinking to positive thinking. So where does negative thinking come from? Have you ever met a negative baby that goes, don't look at me. I've got these triple knees and milk spots and no hair and a little fat tummy and a wrinkly little butt. No, never. Babies are naked with stuff coming out of their mouth, their nose, every orifice, and they still think they're lovable. They have no concept. All babies come onto the planet with positive thinking. I remember years and years ago when my little girl was tiny and I was talking to someone about money. She says, Mommy, you must never worry about money. If you go to the bank, they give you money. You see how her belief was? I was driving her one day and there was a vagrant lying on a bench. She said, Mommy, why is that man not having a home? I said, well, darling, he could have a home, but some people, unfortunately, live like that. They drink a lot of alcohol. They get in a bad place and they don't have a home. And she went, oh, well, he's got a lovely garden to wake up to. When I say things like it's raining, she goes, Mommy, if it didn't rain, the flowers wouldn't get any water. And she was such a great teacher to me that she was naturally positive, naturally looked for the good. She'd see a puddle, that was great fun. She could jump in it. She'd see a worm, she was fascinated by its movement. She'd see snow, that was exciting. And unfortunately, we teach children to be negative. Now my daughter would go to see my mother, come home and go, Mommy, I've got my migraine headache. This will never work out. We've gone all that way for nothing. We'll never find a place to park. They're never gonna have what I want in the store. She was still five years old. So my mother, who I love dearly, was incredibly negative, always sick, and was probably a master in negative thinking. If I took her away, she'd go, well, well they're gonna lose my luggage. The plane will be late. It will never work out. They won't have the food I want. If I took her shopping, she'd go, they'll never have what I want. I bet it's out of stock. And she would be negative in advance of a situation. Let's go out for lunch. Oh, they won't have what I like. I took her out once and I remember her saying, there's nothing on this whole menu I could eat. I can't eat gluten. I can't eat dairy. And it was very hard to say to her, Mom, you're thinking these thoughts and making them real. 
I was lucky that my father was the opposite, very positive, and I obviously chose to be more like him. Doesn't mean I didn't love my mother dearly, but where does this stuff come from, this negative thinking? It will never work out. What's the point? Everything I touch goes wrong. I'm bound to be late. I'm never going to get that job. It won't work out. I mean, everyone else will get that, but it just won't happen. Where does that come from? Unfortunately, it comes from the people that raise us. If you are raised by negative people who go, oh, that's never going to work out. Don't even try that. Oh, it's a scary world out there. You mustn't go there. Don't do that. Even when I sit in the park, I'd see children playing and I'd hear parents go, don't do that, you're going to fall, you're going to break your neck. You don't try and climb that tree, you're going to hurt yourself. Don't swing so high, you could fall. I'd say to my daughter, darling, when you're climbing a tree, look at your hands, look at your feet, be aware. I never go, you're going to fall, you're going to fall now, you're going to fall off any minute. Because I'm telling her she's going to fall. And of course she's going to fall. She had plenty of falls, of course. But we, often with a best intentions program our children not to take risks it's a big bad world don't expect much you'll never do that you can't be top of the class some teachers say that to oh that's too much for you that's too hard that's above your reading level and so we learn to be negative to think small to not aim high and as a second thing in play here that's very important we are hardwired and super coded to go back to what is familiar. Because 500 years ago, familiar made us safe and kept us alive. So our primitive brain in our very modern body wants to run back to what's familiar and run away from what's unfamiliar. But you can train that brain to make being positive familiar and to be negative unfamiliar. Sometimes I have a client who comes in and I talk, they go, well, that won't work. I could do that, but yeah, I could stop eating cake, but you know, cake's the cheapest thing. It makes me happy. And I have to say to them, you're not allowed to say but in this office. And we're going to focus on other things that you can do. I can see that you're instinctively going back to what's familiar. Other clients come in and go, you know, I always date losers and I actually really like bad boys and I'm not interested in a nice person. I go, no, that's just familiar. There's no one that's too good for you. They say, oh, they're too good for me. No, they're unfamiliar. You can make anything familiar. Here's the thing. The first time you take a bit of plastic and shove it in your eyeball, if you're wearing a lens, that is the most unfamiliar thing you can do. Your eye will water and go, get that foreign object out. But if you keep persevering with lenses, you can do that, super familiar, and even do that and squeeze that lens off your eyeball and it's familiar. Peeing in a toilet wasn't familiar once. Getting food in your mouth without aid wasn't familiar. So we're going to learn to make positive thoughts super familiar and negative thoughts so unfamiliar that they just don't exist in your world. We're going to start right now. So all I need you to do is if you're in a chair like this, sit back. It's much better if you can have your neck supported, but for the next 10 minutes, it's not essential. Uncross your legs. Don't sit like that because that's a closed position. Sit with your hands open if you can, your feet and knees apart. Also stops you fiddling and just get ready to understand that we're going to make being a positive thinker so familiar that it stops being what you do and becomes who you are and i promise you i guarantee you it will change your life so make yourself comfortable and remember hypnosis is not scary you are not going to sleep in fact you're going to wake up to the amazing possibilities of who you are and what you can do when you choose to think positive thoughts because it is a choice. You know, I've many times got in a taxi, returned to London, drives and oh, where have you been, America? Oh, lucky you, you know, this country's finished. It's gone to the dogs. Like, I'm really sorry. I have to make a phone call now. I shut the partition because I choose not to get involved in that dialogue. Oh, isn't it terrible? What an awful world. It's dreadful. I prefer to sing that song, I think to myself what a wonderful world because I can choose and the way you feel about anything is down to the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself today 
And for the rest of your life, if you choose, you can fill up your mind with positive thoughts and pictures. And because your mind can only hold one thing, you can't then have negative words and pictures too. You can't be happy and sad, excited and terrified, feeling gray and in pain. So let's go. All I want you to do is to look up like that. The same position your eyes go into and you naturally drift into sleep. I want you to look up. And the trick, and it is a trick, is to keep your eyeballs up to close your lids down. Let's do that now. Look up. Keep your eyeballs up as if you're looking here, but keeping your eyeballs up, close the lids down. And if you can do that, and you just did it, you can't stop yourself going into beautiful healing hypnosis, which is safe, which is wonderful. It's rejuvenating, it's restoring, it's repairing, it's powerful. Hypnosis has changed my entire life, and it can do that for you. It's nothing to be scared of. You can come out of it at any time, but you're really just going to hear my voice guiding you like a meditation. You will like it. So let's get ready. Feet apart, hands not touching. Look up as high as you can. Keep your eyeballs up. Keeping your eyeballs up. Breathe in and breathe out. And take another deep breath. Breathe in. That's good, breathe out. You're not looking at the screen anymore. Your eyeballs are rolled up. So one more time, breathe in. Keep those eyes up for just a few seconds more and keeping your eyeballs up. As you exhale, keep your eyeballs up, but just close your eyelids right down, all the way down, that's it. Just close your eyelids down. Breathe out. And I want you to drop your chin down now so you have that same looking down feeling that you might get as you look over a balcony or down a flight of stairs. You are looking down 10 steps. And as I count backwards, you can see your feet and hear your feet and feel your feet treading each step. This is safe, deeply relaxing, powerfully healing. You are looking down 10 steps. You have that looking down sensation. You are moving on to step 10. As each muscle, every nerve turns loose, lets loose, and you go deeper. You are taking step nine. As you gently, calmly, easily move on over to an even deeper level. You're taking step eight. You can see your feet connecting to every step as you go deeper. You're taking step seven. You can hear your feet touching each step as you go deeper. You are taking step six. You can see your feet, hear your feet, feel your feet connecting to every step as you go deeper and deeper and deeper into a beautiful, profound awareness of yourself. You are taking step five, and you're now going deeper with every sound around you, every sound, every noise. Your own breathing, your own heartbeat are taking you deeper. You're taking step four as you gently calmly, easily, beautifully drift into the most wonderful state of healing hypnosis. You're taking step three, going even deeper still. You're taking step two as each muscle. Every nerve turns loose, lets loose, and you go deeper. And now you're taking step one, just go deeper drift deeper, sink deeper. And as you go deeper, you are listening with your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is taking in everything. And as you go deeper, you're suddenly remembering being a tiny newborn baby. And when you're a tiny newborn baby, the first thing that happened to you is that people assessed you. They counted your fingers and toes. They looked at you. People came to see you. 
and you never looked away and said, don't look at me, I'm having a really bad hair day or no hair day. As a baby, you were born with endless possibilities. Everything excited you. Every new day was exciting. Babies can spend hours looking at their fingers, looking at a mobile, staring at the leaves in a tree. And they are happy. And you were born like that. And even if you think you have forgotten right now, you are starting to reactivate, re-manifest, regenerate and recreate that powerful ability you were born with to be positive. And as you go deeper, you're understanding something that you remember forever. You get the chance to change twice every day for the rest of your life. You can change twice each day. The first change is in the way you think, and the second is in the way you act and react. And you have decided right now to be positive. Being positive is a decision. Decision is a Latin word that means to cut off from. You have made a decision to be positive. And every day you're going to think and indeed say this expression, I am choosing to be positive and I'm choosing feel great about it. I want you to say that out loud right now. Repeat after me. I'm choosing to be positive. I'm choosing to feel great about being positive. I'm choosing to be positive. It isn't even what I do. It's becoming who I am. As you begin to repeat those words to yourself every day, every time you play this recording and many times throughout the day, you are sending a clear message to your mind, I want to be positive, I choose to be positive. Being positive is a choice, it's a choice I'm making and I like it, I love it, I love being positive, I choose positive thoughts. So as you go deeper, just hearing these words is causing your incredible inner mind to hear what I'm saying and beginning to manifest it right now. Just hearing it is causing your mind to act upon it. Your inner mind has no choice but to act upon the words you say. Let's say it again. I'm choosing to be positive I'm choosing to feel great about being positive. Being positive is not what I do, it's who I am. Who I am is positive. I want you to say that, to think it, because as you say and think it, you are becoming a walking, talking, living, powerful, impressive example of a positive person. And you know you have a choice. You look at any event and go, well, how could I make this positive? What's positive about this? I went to Cuba with my husband. He lost all his luggage. I lost most of mine. And it was so wonderful. We wore the same clothes every day. It was great not to have to think, what shall I put on? It was incredibly freeing. I actually really saw the benefits in that. And that's when I learned to say, what's good about this? What's great about this? How can I make this positive? And I want you to think, how can you make every thought positive? How can you go through life being positive? Well, the easiest way is to look at a negative thought and to flip it over. That will go wrong. It could go right. Who will like me? Why wouldn't people like me? I can't do that. I can do it. I don't know enough. I will learn enough. What's good about this? What's great about this? What can I learn from this? And every day my words are going in, sinking into you like lotion on dry skin. When you put lotion on dry skin, it sinks in and it nourishes you. And the words on this recording nourish you every day. They sink in, they make an impact, and they remind you of a truth. The way you feel about everything 
is down to the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself. And you are making positive pictures and positive words because that is your choice. You choose to fill up your mind with positive images and positive words no matter what. No matter what, you get to choose those two changes every day. You choose to put positive images in your head. You choose to use positive words always, always, always. And you choose something else. You choose to remember your thoughts control your feelings. Your feelings control your actions and your actions justify your behavior. And every day you remember to take that right back to the truth. The only thing you can really control are your thoughts. And as you make your thoughts positive, your life is changing in the most powerful way. As you make your thoughts positive, your life is becoming wonderful, extraordinary. I want you to imagine you know someone who is a positive thinker. We can all find someone, even if it's on the screen. What would they say every day? How would they run their life? How would they cope with adversity? How do positive thinkers talk? How do they conduct their life? What do they do? They say things like, well, sorry it didn't work out. Sorry you don't like me. I like myself. Oh, you really can't reject me because only I have the power to reject me. That's unfortunate, but I believe something good will come of it. You see, you can choose. So imagine you're metamorphosizing into someone positive. That positive thoughts and beliefs are just melding into you, merging into you, that positive person that you know of or know, their thoughts are becoming your thoughts, their words are becoming your words, your words shape your reality. You have chosen to think positive thoughts, to speak positive words, it's already changing your life. And one of the fastest ways to be super positive is to say things like, I can, I always, I do. Remember the words that follow I am will follow you. So let's end this amazing hypnosis recording with some I am statements. I am positive. I am always positive. I can always see the positive in any event. I always do see the positive. I look for the positive. I find the positive. See, here's another truth. Whatever you look for, you will find. Repeat after me. I am positive. I am always positive. I am a positive person. Being positive is who I am. I think positively. Thinking positive is who I am. It's what I do. It's me. I am positive naturally, instinctively, intuitively. I look for the positive and when I look for it, I find it. What I look for, I find. I invite you to repeat those statements and any others many, many times as you play this audio. I am, I can, I always, I do. And let me know how fast you change. And remember, you can change who you are and how you feel every day by using positive words. And if you think a negative one, just flip it over and say the positive instead because your mind doesn't know and it really doesn't care which one is right. Choose the positive and you are choosing to change your life. Check out my next video here. Anyone notice that as that day comes around, they're sick? Because here's how the mind works. You say, oh my God, I volunteered to chair that meeting. I must have been out of my mind. I'd die if I've got to go on stage. I don't want to do that. And your brain's like, leave that with me. Now next Wednesday.